Joshua, thank you so much for taking the time to chat and really share your wisdom. You know, as as we sort of said earlier when we were, uh, you know, sort of like in, in the green room that uh, we've been following each other, you know, on social and LinkedIn. And so I've, I've really appreciated your your content and was excited that you were open to being on the show. So thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jorge. I'm excited to chat. Like I said, all things go to market, win, loss, and otherwise. So happy to be here. Awesome. Well, I guess for the folks out there who are asking themselves, okay, what is win-loss analysis and why should product marketers conduct them? And I think from the perspective of like, I think you have a very, very unique perspective. It's not just about like running some report and hoping someone understands what it means. Yeah. I mean, when you when you kind of think about fundamentally what win-loss analysis is, it is examining your business opportunities, the, the deals that you're seeing through Go through your pipeline and try and understand what is working and amplifying those positive aspects. But then I think more focus is on what's not working mm. um, and trying to fix what isn't working and really enhancing the buyer's journey because ultimately where people want to get to is they want to increase win rates, right? As mm -hmm. any customer-facing team or go-to-market team, whether product marketing, sales or otherwise, you're probably too main goals are um, increasing conversions or, or, or win rates and or uh, revenue numbers. So um, there's a number of different kind of like permutations of what the analysis looks like, but fundamentally that is what win-loss analysis um, is. So I'm happy to go into some of those different permutations, but that's essentially what, when you break it down to its core, win-loss analysis involves. Yeah, and from a product marketing perspective, you know, some might say, "Oh, well, you know, those are those are things that maybe the the sales manager is going to dig into, or sales ops, um, or you know, now there's like these revenue intelligence folks, right, mm -hmm. who who are rev ops are, are digging into, you know, just for the product marketers who are watching, why should they dig in, and and what are those permutations?" Uh, that that maybe they should be aware of? Yeah, it's a good question. So I'll start with the permutations. There's a number of different ways kind of you could look at um, analyzing your data. And it's kind of like a, a, a continuum from the lowest effort, and I would say the least accurate, all the way through to the highest effort and the most accurate. So um, often sales-led B2B um, organizations will have CRM data and they'll have a reason for why a deal, why they won a deal or why they lost a deal. Mm. Um, so PMs can, PMMs can go in there and look at that data to get an understanding of or get a feel for themselves what worked and what didn't and where there might be some gaps that they can fill, whether it's through um, improvements in messaging, sales enablement, et cetera, et cetera. The issue with that is that data is from the perspective of the person selling and in many instances it doesn't align with what the buyer says was the reason for the the um the either the win um the successful completion of the deal or um in in other instances uh the unsuccessful um uh securing of the deal and mm. so there's a mismatch between those two perspectives right and and sales often isn't incentivized to spend time digging into and looking at why something worked or didn't work. Um, and so there's inherent biases in that data. Um, not to say there's not value in, in looking at that data, but um, it's just a, a watch out for project, uh, product marketers to not put all your eggs in that basket. If you move up slightly, there's um, surveys. Um, and so it's when um, I've seen product marketers send out um, and sales uh, team members actually send out surveys when um, a deal is closed out. Um, and that also provides some data, but the richness of that data is limited to what you can capture in a survey, right? And we've all done surveys before. I don't know about you, but in some of the surveys I completed, I complete, I'm like, oh, I don't quite understand what the questions Sure getting at or i want to elaborate on this but i don't know if this is something that i should elaborate on mm. or i just don't have any place to elaborate on my answer 
And so there's some of the shortcomings of a survey. Again, there's value in it and there's a time and a place. But um, if you slide up the scale a little bit more with one-on-one interviews, they're the gold standard in my mind. And that's what I focus on. And yes, they are the most time intensive, but unlike the CRM data and unlike surveys, your focus focusing on a deep understanding of people's motivations and you're able to understand that through one-on-one conversations to the level of detail that you just can't get through uh, either CRM data um, because it's not from the straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak, or from surveys. And so um, there's a lot of value and richness in doing one-on-one interviews, especially in understanding the underlying motivations, the the why of some of the other data that you're able to collect internally. So really, if you look at any of those forms of um, analysis, it's, it's data over guesswork, right? It's replacing the intuition-based decisions mm. that often product marketers are... I don't want to say forced into making, but have to make because of the limited resources that they have with data-driven insights. Um, and if you think about um, what that, why that's important, well, it's crucial for not only acquisition, but also conversion um, and understanding what is and isn't working and making um, tweaks to, to ensure that that is trending in the right direction. And again, ultimately, the impact is when you're understanding what is and isn't working about why your um, buyer's journey or the sales process is um, uh, leaky or uh, got points of friction, it's so that you can streamline that process and ultimately Mm. improve win rates and revenue, which um, when you look at some of the data, win-loss analysis uh, um, impacts significantly when done in a sustained and um, concentrated effort over time. So that's why as a PMM, a PMM, I would be concentrating on collecting this data in addition to some of the other data, which I'm sure we'll kind of talk about uh, shortly. You know, there were a couple of things that really stood out to me just given some of the conversations that we've been having internally mm-hmm. with our co-founders and, um, and really trying to kind of, you know, nail the product and what we focus on here at Asset Mule. And, and one of the discussions that we've been having is the kind of distinction between buyer enablement or that buyer journey, you know, kind mm-hmm. of what they're experiencing uh, on their side versus sales enablement and the sales process, right? And if, you know, number one, like, is there a distinction, right? And, um, you know, I personally believe that there is, right? There's that experience that the buyer is having. There's the kind of like uh, conversations and internally or internal discussions and these sort of things that are happening internally within the uh, the buyer's organization. And then there's all this stuff we're doing on the sales side saying, okay, this is our process. This is what, what we're trying to sort of like push the, the buyer into. And, uh, you know, there've been a lot of tools the last couple of years that have popped up trying to really kind of sort of consumerize the the b2b purchasing journey um and, and those sort of things and so i it feels like there's this shift between hey i'm a salesperson with a sales process that has been developed by my sales lead, leadership team uh, hopefully in collaboration with product marketing and other stakeholders right um but uh but there's that but then there's really a, this focus now on like creating an environment where the buyer is essentially dictating, you know, the experience that, that they want. So in some cases Mm -hmm. it's, you know, product led in other cases, it's hey, I wanted to speak to a salesperson right now and those sort of things. Myself as a salesperson, I've always tried to put myself into the mind of the buyer and dictate my sales process based on, on that. Right. Like, uh, you know, from your perspective, like, do you think there's a, you know, like from you, you know, you as an expert in win loss analysis and then just, you know, product marketing as a whole, do you see kind of these things that we're, we're seeing? Um, and like, do, do you think that, I guess that it's up to, uh, product marketing to also be involved in determining, hey, what should that buyer's journey look like based off of the data that they're collecting? Uh, you know, of course, cross-referencing that with what sales is doing. 
Yeah, I mean, if I, I think there is a distinction, but I think there's like a, a yes, but to that. So um, if your main goal is understanding what is and isn't working in the in in the journey now i i explicitly and consciously say buyer's journey when i talk to you know uh the the pipeline the sales pipeline because it shifts the focus from um uh internal an internal understanding of how things work to an external customer or buyer led understanding of how people go through the different stages and i think as a as a seller, it's easy to default back to like a standard funnel because that's what is taught, that's what we're comfortable with, that's what is known. It's sometimes I think a little more scarier to think about that from the buyer's perspective because it is more complex. It's not a straight line kind of like funnel that kind of comes in. It is complicated and zigs in, uh, in and out and goes back and forth, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, I think as long as the sales enable is within the context of what it is the buyer is trying to achieve and the journey they go through in, in, in trying to achieve that outcome, then I think that is fine. There can be two different, um, uh, two, there's like two different uh, journeys there, mm. but the sales journey needs to be within the context of what the buyer is trying to achieve. And if you can marry up those two things, which is, far easier said than done, then you stand to help those buyers make progress as effectively and efficiently through that funnel, funnel, I should say journey, as as possible. And so rather than trying to, you know, pigeonhole them into your understanding of how they work, you're meeting them on their terms. I love it. Yeah. I mean that that's sort of the way that I've always approached it in in my when I was selling. And uh and I think these product like tours or or product demos, the interactive ones that have popped up, you know, mm. these deal rooms. Like, I mean, there's just been a plethora of tools that have really which refreshingly are trying to meet buyers where they want to be, right? Like there was that old, yeah. I remember back in the day with with HubSpot, they were like, oh, 70% of the buyer re research was already done about your solution before you even talked to a salesperson. Yes. So you needed to enable that with content and, and all these sort of things. And exactly. now, you know, the latest data that I'm reading is, oh, now it's closer to 80, even, you know, 90 at times because of these uh, remote first environments and, and uh, you know, and so on. So that really, really resonates. It really makes sense to me. You know, there, there I think as I've done 200 or 50, 250 or so, give or take, uh, interviews over mm -hmm. the the last year, you know, primarily in 2023. You know, I've talked to a lot of these product marketers who are out there and saying, you know what, customer research or prospect research is really, really important. But like mm -hmm. me getting buy in from the stakeholders within the revenue team can be a challenge at times because on one side, CS is like guarding their customers and, you know, and, and wanting to control it, uh, kind of the access to them. And then this is also happening from a sales perspective. So for yeah. those sales, or let's just say revenue leaders out there who are watching why is customer research or prospect research uh, really, really important? And you know, what would you say are some best practices around around really getting th those stakeholders to buy in if you're a PMM? Yeah, it's a it's a pretty common um, question that I get, as a, especially from a product market, is how do I how do I get buy in for the research that they desperately want to do, but others might not see the value in doing it. So. Um, look, I think if you can frame it in terms of um, if we do this research, we can answer critical business questions that we have. It's very hard as, as a sales leader, as a you know, as a as a, a CEO or whatever it might be, or a product leader, to argue against that because why wouldn't you want to? understand gaps or filling gaps in your own knowledge, uh, important gaps in your knowledge through this research. So it's not about just, I think, from a, from a product marketer's perspective, thinking about what they need and why they want to do win-loss analysis, for instance, to test out new messaging. Um, yes, there is value in doing that, but 
at least initially think about what are the big hairy problems that the business is facing? What are the objectives that we are trying to, the goals that we're trying to meet right now? And how can I position this research, at least initially, whether win-loss interviews or otherwise, in a way that I can, at the very least, feed into those discussions um, and bring light to where there is kind of um, darkness, so to speak. And I think um, that's one thing I think product marketers can do. The other thing which I always advocate for is starting with a pilot study. Don't try and pitch a um, comprehensive ongoing win-loss program, which I think is best practice to do eventually, uh, like an ongoing um, pulse of the current market dynamics. But initially, just pitch a, a an ad hoc once-off um, a bunch of interviews, again, concentrating on the highest um, value areas within the business right now with the lowest amount of effort. And when I say lowest amount of effort, you can probably do, you could probably, depending on how, what other priorities you have, but let's say you had a, um, a clean slate at it, you could probably get that done within three to four weeks. Um, you know, I, I can get it done in probably two weeks, but I'm coming in and um, I don't have anything else that I, I do. This is what I do. Mm-hmm. But someone who hasn't done it before might take a little bit longer. So it's not unreasonable to have that all um, tied up and done within three to four weeks while being able to concentrate on some other things. So definitely mm-hmm. pitch a pilot first. Um, two other things, the one of them being... Um, show the ROI. So there was a number of studies that have been done. I think Gartner released something a while ago saying that those who have an ongoing win-loss program uh, see a 15 to 30%, I think, uplift or increase in revenue as a result of that Mm -hmm. program that can attribute to, directly attribute to that uh, program itself, Um, as well as that up to 50% increase in win rate. Now, I think that 50% is a bit ambitious uh but the point is that there is significant gains to be had from putting in the effort and so you can take that data and you can even pair some of that back and say instead of 50 percent, we're going to go with 30 percent or 20 percent um and you can run numbers on your own current state of the business and say hey um this is a pretty reputable organization this is what they're saying is um, the result, the net benefit of doing win-loss analysis. This is what equates to in our business. What do you think? And so if you look at those numbers, if you're a B2B company selling, you know, millions of dollars a year worth of business currently, that's a pretty big increase in um, in your revenue and your bottom line. So very hard to say no to when you're putting those numbers in front of people, especially when you're talking about a three-week investment, so to speak. Um, so that's another one. Uh, and the other, the other, I think, final and probably the thing that I like to concentrate on the most when I do the work is making the, the, the output um, actionable. Um, I, I hate research that sits on a shelf and collects dust. And if it doesn't lead to any action, then, then research is useless, right? And so you have to be very... Um, purposeful in how you share that information and what you do with it. And there's ways that 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 can be kind of done, but ensure that it's acted upon and it just doesn't get lost in a million of other things that that people end up doing Um, after that initial dopamine hit of, oh, goodness, look how amazing this um, this data is. And then it kind of, you know, falls off a cliff and no one speaks about it ever again. So it's all about momentum. They're the things that I would concentrate on um, pitching and doing as a, as a product marketer um, for your win-loss initiative. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. I mean, if, if you can really increase revenue 15 to 30%, I mean, that's, that's pretty damn susten- substantial, especially right now, right? So, uh, exactly. you know, for folks, you should absolutely look into this. You know, from a perspective of a PMM, you know, we, we talk a lot about like the voice of the customer or voice of the mm-hmm. prospect. I know you've, You've talked a lot about that uh, on, you know, through your content on LinkedIn. How do you determine? And I know this is a big question, but uh, you know, kind of at a high level, if, if for folks who are trying to kind of figure this out and 
trying to figure out how to do it properly, any sort of like high level advice around how to determine what that voice of the customer is, but then also like externally communicate that right outside of the organization and then ultimately enable others to be able to, to communicate in that way. Yeah, it's a good question. And I think it kind of is a follow on from my last point in terms of like just data gathering, gathering dust um, and research reports, gathering dust on a, on a shelf somewhere. So look, there's, there's a few things that, that I think product marketers can do. Firstly, is involving stakeholders throughout the process. And I'm not advocating for product marketers to involve your sales team members on interviews. It's, I, I, I advise against that, in fact, because um, I think it can bias um, some of the, some of the, the results um, and, and, and prospects just don't feel comfortable sometimes when, when the salesperson they're interacting with is on those interviews. But what I do advocate for is... Um, getting them bought in firstly to the process, which we've kind of already discussed. Uh, but then, but then um, uh, the subsequent um, share outs that happen both at a rolled up level, but then also at a kind of like an individual level as well. And so um, there's kind of different schools of thought on how individualized you can go with the feedback. What you don't want to do as a product marketer is single people out and say, Hey, Jeff, um, you were rude and forceful in some of your conversations. Can you please um, just back off a little bit? That's not what this is about, but um, you can kind of roll it up to a, a, um, a, a team level and kind of discuss it at kind of at, at, at that level, but just not single people, single people out. So um, I always kind of advocate for not not... Um, focusing on individual uh, feedback, but kind of more at the uh, uh, consolidated level, the next level up. I think that's really important so that uh, people don't feel feel singled out um, and um, and like you're kind of you know, challenging challenging them individually. Mm -hmm. I think also as a as a product marketer, once you get the results back from these interviews. Look at the buyer's journey from that first touch point you have with them all the way through to the moment they make a decision and almost audit what are the different assets that we what are the different assets that we have across this buyer's journey? What is the data saying? And what are some of our hunches in terms of what needs to change um, as a result of the data that we've collected? And there might need to be some. Uh, and and that could be things like one pages. Um, uh, it could be battle cards. It could be messaging on a website. Um, whatever it might be, but looking at looking at that information and looking at where are the gaps between what we do right now and where we want to go. Um, and where we want to go doesn't need to be entirely dictated from the voice of the customer, the voice of the prospect. It can be that can be an input into those conversations. Um, I think fairly strong um, input into those conversations. But looking at that delta and saying, what do we need to do? What are some ideas that we have that we can look at implementing um, that will close close that delta? And there might need to be ongoing conversations that have either with customers or prospects additional rounds of, you know, win-loss interviews, which is why there's value in doing it over a period of time. There might be different research. There might be analytics that you need to look into. There might be discussions with other stakeholders that need to happen. But using that journey as a way to audit your current state and where you need to, to go to. Um, and I think that's why I try and advocate for looking at it from the buyer's perspective because of the conversations that you have in these win-loss interviews, you're getting you're getting their feedback from their own perspective of what that journey was like. Um, and that's ultimately all that matters, right? And so it makes sense then to look at things from my perspective, from the perspective of that journey and then how your sales team, how product marketing, um, et cetera, et cetera, feed, feed into that.
Awesome. So hopefully that hopefully that answers your question. Absolutely. Well, Joshua, thank you so so much for taking the time to share your wisdom. Uh, hopefully, the, the, you know, folks will take this and start to implement this right away and start to dig in and prepare themselves if they do have an organization. Maybe that this is a new concept. Uh, at so uh, really really appreciate it. If folks wanted to follow you on social media, I think I know the answer of the best channel, but. Uh, but uh, yeah, if they if they did want to follow you on social or maybe check out a URL or a website that you have to learn more about how you can help them with win loss analysis and and maybe some other you know services, what are the best uh, channels to reach you? Yeah, um, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm uh, increasingly active on uh, that platform. So Joshua Fryzer, spelled F R Y S Z or Z depending on where you are in the world, ER. Um, it's a bit of a doozy. So Joshua Fryzer. Um, or just hit me up at josh at aharesearch.io. And aha is spelled A-H-A. Um, and yeah, just either hit me up by email or you can slide into my DMs. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Awesome. Well, have a wonderful, wonderful day. And I uh, hope to see you at some point. Maybe I can get out to Australia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let us know if you're out here. Thanks, Jorge. I appreciate it. It's been great chatting. Absolutely. Have a great day.